Ever since Jesus pardoned me, I've been shouting victory. I'm finding new joy that thrills my soul. Keeping me happy all day long as I press on with heaven's throng. I'm finding new joy that thrills my soul. I'm finding new joy each passing day by serving my Lord along life's way. Since Jesus came in and made me whole, I'm finding new joy that thrills my soul. I'm so glad that Jesus came, gave me grace, so praise his name. I'm finding new joy that thrills my soul. I've been trusting in His love, coming from glory land above. I'm finding new joy that thrills my soul. I'm finding new joy each passing day while serving my Lord along life's way. Since Jesus came in and made me whole, I'm finding new joy. Nothing will ever turn me round, for I'm gaining higher ground. I'm finding new joy that thrills my soul. Oh, I must travel here below. Jesus is with me, this I know. I'm finding new joy that thrills my soul. I'm finding new joy each passing day while serving my Lord. A long last way. Since Jesus came in and made me whole, I'm finding new joy that thrills my soul. I was beginning to hear you over there. Moses led God's children for Going through the night. Oh, they said, let's turn back. Moses said, keep going. Cain and Flame, they trust inside. There will be no sorrow there in that tomorrow. We will be there by and by.
Turn to Joshua chapter 9 tonight. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 9. We're going to start reading at verse number 8. And they, they being the Gibeonites, said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are ye, and from whence come ye? And they said unto him, From a very far country thy servants are come, because of the name of the Lord thy God. For we have heard the fame of him, and all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan, to Sion king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtaroth. Wherefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals with you for the journey, and go to meet them, and say unto them, We are your servants. Therefore now make ye a league with us. This our bread we took hot for our provision out of our houses on the day we came forth to go unto you. But now, behold... It is dry and it is moldy. And these bottles of wine which we filled were new. And behold, they be rent. And these are garments and our shoes are become old by reason of the very long journey. And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word tonight. So a couple of weeks ago, Prior to Bible school, we were looking at this passage and we saw how these Gibeonites had chosen a very different tactic in how they were going to deal with Israel. They weren't going to try to fight against them. Instead, they were going to try to deceive them. And so they passed themselves off. They misrepresent themselves as being from a faraway place. And they've got all this false evidence that they brought with them which turns out to be very convincing. Uh, they went to a lot of trouble to get Israel to believe this lie. We talked about how that their motivation was fear. Uh, there in verse number 9, they said they had heard about the Lord and his fame and all that he had done in Egypt, how he had brought uh, his people out of bondage there. So they have a fear of God a respect and a reverence for his power and for what he is able to do. We compared their response, their reasoning, to that of Rahab. And we saw that Rahab, she came to the Israelites, or she came to God by faith. Fear and faith are not the same thing. Uh, we do need to fear the Lord. We need to reverence him and uh, honor him in the way that uh, he deserves. But that will not save us. Uh, the only way to be saved is by grace through faith. And so they were not uh, being faithful here. In fact, they were lying to God's people. And so they bring all this false evidence with them. And we talked about how there's a lot of false evidence out there today. The devil, he's just like these people. He's got all his wiles that he uses against us. He's trying to, to trick us, to deceive us, and to get us to believe a lie, and he presents us with false evidence every day. And just like what they brought with them, it can be very convincing, very persuading. And so we have to be careful about these things. And so we see now in verse number 14 what happens, how the Israelites respond. It says in verse 14, And the men 
took of their victuals. What we're going to see tonight, I believe, are the complications of compromise. The complications of compromise. Now, compromise is not always bad. It's not always wrong. In fact, when you've got people who are trying to to get along, sometimes it's necessary. And that can especially be true in a Baptist church. And you either say amen or oh me right there, but you know it's true. So compromise can be good, but sometimes it's not good. And uh, many times it brings with it complications, things we didn't expect. Uh, When we make compromises, the truth is it doesn't always turn out like we thought it would, right? Doesn't always go as smoothly and as easily as we had hoped that it would. So there can be complications, and we need to be aware of that. And we're going to see that that was true for Joshua and the Israelites here as well. And it starts with the men taking of their victuals. Now, for some reason, they decide to start sharing these people's moldy bread and wine. Uh, If you get right down to it, it was probably more of the wine than the moldy bread, uh, if I had to guess. But what's happening here is what happens so often when compromise begins, uh, when it starts out. Uh, It starts out with us taking part, with us joining in with the world and taking of their victuals, their provisions. And there's a lot of things that the world provides, a lot of things that the world offers to us. And some of those things are not bad. Some of those things are Completely okay. But some of those things are bad. And some of those things will lead to sin in our lives. They will put us on a sinful path. Things like alcohol. They had alcohol here. Wine anyway. Drugs. Other things uh, that are the victuals of the world. And so they're taking part in these things. They're joining in. And so many times... That's where compromise comes from. Because we don't want to be left out, right? We want to be included. We don't want to feel like we're missing out on the fun. And so we take of their victuals too. That's the first mistake that they made here, I believe. Second mistake they made was their biggest mistake. And it was the one that really was a problem. And that's in the second part of verse 14. It says, then they ask not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. That was their biggest mistake. And it's a mistake that we frequently make uh, that so often leads to trouble and heartache and sorrow in our lives. Before we make decisions, important decisions, big decisions, we should do this very thing should pray about it first, right? They didn't pray about it. Before we make snap decisions, before we do these rushes to judgment, because so many times we just get in a hurry and want to get it done. I know I do that. I get in a hurry and I get ahead of God. And I get ahead of everything else in my life as well. And that's when I make bad choices. I make wrong decisions. When the right thing, the wise thing for me to do is to slow down, stop, and talk to God about it first. Ask his counsel. If there is anybody who's a good counselor, it's him. If there's anybody who is a willing counselor, it is him. Some people might not want to give you advice. You might go to them and they'll just... Decline, not want to. I've never had God turn me away when I went to him for advice. And so we should ask ourselves, where does our counsel come from? Where do we go for our counsel, for advice? If you needed guidance tonight, 
where would you go? Where would be your first choice? I'll tell you where it should be to get down on your knees and call out to him. Say, Lord, I need your advice. I need your help. I need your guidance. I need your direction. I want to make the right choice, Lord. I want to make the good decision, the one that you would have me to. They didn't do that, but they should have, and so should we. They said they, it says they ask not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. Our sincerest and greatest desire tonight should be for God to speak to us. Especially if I've got a problem, something that's worrying me, a burden that I'm trying to carry in my life that I just don't know what to do with. I should say, Lord... Tell me what to do. Talk to me, Lord. Tell me what your will is for my life. Show me which way to go. I need your guidance, your leadership in my life. We'd avoid a lot of mistakes that way, wouldn't we? We would eliminate a lot of problems. I truly believe if we would ask his counsel, ask him to speak to us, first okay verse 15 let's see what happens since they've made these mistakes verse 15 it says and Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live and it's clear the Bible says that Joshua did this now he is a type of Christ he represents Christ but he was not Christ okay he was, which means he was not perfect. He was human, just like we are. He was a godly man, a godly leader, a spiritual man. But he made mistakes too. And so here he does this. He, he leads in making this decision. And the decision is to make peace with them. So what's wrong with that? Sounds like a good thing, right? Um, making peace being peacemakers, living peaceably with all men so far as it lies with us. Well, you got to think about who them is, okay? you got to think about who you're making peace with. Because in this case, and in our case, if we make peace with them, we won't have peace with him. Making peace with the world means we will not have peace with God. We talked about that. The Bible clearly says in James chapter 4, verse 4, if you're going to be the friend of the world, then you are going to also be the enemy of God. You can't have it both ways. So why do we make peace with them? Why do we seek peace with the world? Why do we even do that? Why do we even consider that? Because, folks, the truth is we are at odds with them. We are at odds with the world. The church is at odds with the world. We might want to believe differently, but this is the truth. And the reason we are at odds with them is because we have completely different missions. What is our mission? To go into the whole world and teach them whatsoever the Lord has commanded us and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's our mission. That's our goal. That's our purpose. What's their mission? Not that. (laughs) Not at all. It's not to do God's will. It's to do their will. It's not to serve Him, it's to be served. It's not to be saved, it's to just live their life however they want to. We are at odds with the world. We cannot make peace with them and have peace with Him. So why do we even try? Why do we even consider it? Well, it's because we want to bring a cease to the hostilities. So that's the reason to make peace with anybody. You want to cease hostilities. 
I think a lot of Christians today would prefer to avoid the conflicts and the confrontations that it brings to us. If you're going to stand for God, if you're going to live for God, it will bring conflict your way out here in the world. It absolutely will on your job or wherever it may be. And I think a lot of us want to sue for peace and avoid that if we can. It's like the old saying says, you got to go along to get along. You ever heard that? So there's a thinking. There's this idea that has crept into the church, that has crept in among God's people. I've got to go along with them so I can get along with them. Where did God say it was our mission to get along with them? He said our mission was to teach them whatsoever He's commanded us. And our mission is to baptize them, to see them saved, to win them to the Lord. Not to get along with them. I'm not telling you go out and be hateful and ugly and mean. Don't misinterpret this at all. But we think about making peace with them. Seems like a harmless course of action, don't it? Seems like a benign and tolerant way to live. But making peace with them leads to making a pact with them too. It did for Joshua. Look at that. It says, And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them. If you're going to make peace with them, you're going to also have to make a pact with them. So once you start taking of their victuals and start trying to get along, before you know it, you start agreeing with them. You start agreeing with their lifestyles. Some of their beliefs aren't so bad. And more and more that happens. Increasingly we become okay with it. See the compromise that's happening here? And the complications that it can bring? The church is okay with things today that it didn't used to be. There are things that used to be considered sin that are not looked at that way any any longer. Things that were once called abominations are now considered to be normal and acceptable. This is how compromise works. This is where it leads to. You don't just make peace with them, you make a pact with them. You might say, oh well, I won't let that happen. I won't let that happen to me. I won't allow it to go that far. I just want to have peace with them. I don't want to make a pact with them. Okay, but how else do you think that peace will hold? How else is that peace supposed to last without a pact, without a league, without an agreement? What I'm telling you is that somebody's got to compromise. Somebody will have to compromise their convictions. Somebody will have to give in. Because we're over here and they're over there. And normally what is supposed to happen in a compromise is that both sides give so that they can meet in the middle. The world's not going to do that. The world says... We have to come all the way over here. And the church has been moving that way for years. Somehow we've also got this false idea, this crazy idea that the only way to win the world, the only way to accomplish this mission that the Lord has given to us is we have to become more like the world so that the world will like us better, so that we'll seem more Uh, acceptable, more inviting to the world. When really what we're supposed to do, God says, is to remain separate. Stay where we are. Don't compromise our convictions. Don't compromise our values and our beliefs. Be steadfast and be true. Complications of compromise. 
So Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them. For what? To let them live. And that goes against God's instructions <clears throat> that he had given to, the <clears throat> to his people. It goes against what he had commanded them to do. He had commanded them to utterly destroy all the inhabitants of the land. To not let them live. And we said that God was not just physically but spiritually purging this, this land. Making it a holy land for his people. By removing these who could be a, a bad influence. A negative influence on his people. And we'll talk more about uh, this later. The last part of verse 15 says, And the princes of the congregation swear unto them. <clears throat> okay, so Joshua may have took the lead here. He may have been the one that made peace and the pact with them. But the other leaders, they go along with him. They support him. They back him on this, which I guess is what you do when your leader makes a decision like this. And so they're on board. Now this relationship with the Gibeonites, <clears throat> if you look at it and what was to come after this, I guess it turns out okay for the most part. <clears throat> there turned out to be some good things about Gibeon. Uh, later on, it would become sort of a priestly city as that's where the ark would stay more than once. On several occasions, they would keep the ark there in Gibeon. The Bible says that one of David's mighty men was a Gibeonite. So he became an ally for David. There was one little problem that would come up. And I don't guess I should call it little. One problem that came up, an issue. And that happened when Saul was king. And he got this burst of patriotism. He became very zealous and very patriotic and he decided he was going to show how patriotic he was. He was going to prove what a great king and what a loyal Israelite he was by killing the Gibeonites, by slaying them. And because of what's happening right here, he shouldn't have done that. Uh, he's breaking this pact, this promise that's made. And because of what he, he does... Israel, under David's reign, goes through three years of famine. They, they suffer famine for three years because of what Saul does, violating this, this league that was made. Okay? <clears throat> Verse 16. It came to pass at the end of three days, after they had made a league with them, that they heard that they were their neighbors and that they dwelt among them. Is anybody surprised by that? <laughs> anybody surprised that it took three days? That's prob probably the only surprising thing. But three days later, I guess they're gone back to their home. The Israelites here. And doesn't that always happen? You hear. You find out. Somebody tells you. That's the thing about a lie. It's not going to last forever. It's not going to be able to stand forever. The truth will come out eventually. We'll hear. You'll hear. They'll hear. Somebody will spill the beans. We don't know who it was, but somebody comes along and rats them out. So now they know. So what do the Israelites do? Verse 17 says, And the children of Israel journeyed, and came into their cities on the third day. They just all load up and go up there. It takes them three days to get there, but they make this journey to go, and they're just going to confront them. They come to their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon and Shephira and Beeroth and Kirjath Jearim. So not only do they live here, they got three cities, which proves... They've been living here. They've been here for a while. So their lie is fully exposed. The truth has been fully revealed. And that's how it works, folks. That's always the outcome. The truth is revealed. The lie is exposed. 
And it is for them. And then in verse 18, it says, And the children of Israel smote them not, because the princes of the congregation had sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. And all the congregation murmured against the princes. So it looks to me like the people wanted to go up there and smite them. They wanted to go up there and wipe them out, just utterly destroy them, just like God had told them to in the first place. But they don't. And the reason they don't is because the princes had made this promise, had made this uh, covenant. And so they prevent the people from doing this. What happens? It says, And all the congregation murmured against the princes. Remember, we're talking about the complications of compromise. Now, everybody's unhappy. That's what they say about compromise. That you got two parties that are compromising, but in the end, nobody's happy. Right? Well, they're not happy. And so they're not just murmuring about the princes. They are murmuring against the princes, the Bible says. See these complications that can come? How things can get sticky and messed up? That's happening here. They're murmuring against their leaders. There is dissension in the ranks. Uh, there is doubt that has crept in. That is causing the people to question their leaders. Uh, to criticize their leaders. No doubt there has been a loss of confidence at least to some degree, in their leaders. So it can cause bad things to come in uh, and begin to work in, in a congregation, murmuring against their leaders. And I need to stop right there for tonight because we need to have a short business meeting. So if you are visiting with us tonight, we're glad you came. We welcome you to come back anytime, but you can also feel welcome to go. You're welcome to stay, but business meetings are usually not that exciting. So thank you for coming.